let's get to our initial panel. And this is going to be looking at the future of health. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Olivier Laureau, who's president of the Servier Group, Jan Kimpen, Global Health Medical Officer at Philips, Mark Miller, the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Bio Meriu, and Ari Nordstedt, Acting Director, People Director General for Research and Innovation in the European Commission. Thank you for all of you for joining us today. We look forward to hearing your input. And we're going to actually start with hearing uh, up to about three minutes from each of you so that you can set out your stall. Olivia Loro, if I could call on you first. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Maxine. Thank you for the opportunity to present some uh, critical aspects to consider when we look to the future of uh, research in, in Europe. As uh, president of Servier Laboratories and chair of the uh, IMI board, I am proud of the role played by Servier in IMI for more than 12 years. IMI projects are more than an opportunity. They are critical and they deliver at least two main outcomes. First, they contribute to improve our R&D efficiency with data, tools, and platforms. And second, they reinforce an ecosystem which is of great value for us as an industry, as well as for Europe at large. There are three main topics that I see as crucial for the future of research, and they are innovation, impact, and inclusion. For me, innovation is the translation of research in a product or service within a cross-sectorial ecosystem <clears throat> that brings therapeutic value, social value, and economic value. And HMEI has provided many excellent examples of the value of a research development innovation continuum. Impact. Impact is the second point. Making a positive impact for and with patients. And when looking at public-private partnerships from <coughs> a pharmaceutical industry point of view, I believe that we are part of the solution. Over the past few months, we have seen that AMAI has been flexible enough to launch major projects on COVID-19, such as care projects. And this is because within AMAI, there is this ambition to make an impact on health and society. And for the future health partnership, we need a framework that can be adapted to our ambitions and not fall into the trap of limiting our ambition to the framework. So that future health research may be innovative and make an impact. It must also be inclusive and allow contributions from all over Europe, as well as contributions from all over the world. This will contribute to the influence of Europe and serve the competitive Europe and survival strategy in health. I am convinced that together, through HMEI, we can build this formidable systemic and resilient ecosystem, which will be major boost for the competitivity of Europe and for the patient benefit. So let's do it together. Thank you. Olivier, thank you very much indeed. Uh, can I call on Jan Kempen now, please? Yes, thank you, Maxine. Uh, this IMI meeting is indeed really, really timely. And it is my, my pleasure and my honor to represent the MedTech company and Philips here today because we are, it's the first time that the medical technology is part of the IMI initiative. And there is an urgent need to step up the collaboration among all the stakeholders uh, on research and innovation because healthcare is really under pressure. It was under pressure before COVID-19 hit us. We have a growing and aging population. We have multiple chronic diseases and we have a healthcare system that is on the verge of breaking. It is too costly. There is a lot of burnout in healthcare professionals and the patient experience is not what it should be. On top of that came COVID. And what we have seen during COVID 
uh, is that we can move very, very, very fast. We saw digital kicking in at an, at an accelerated pace. We saw virtual care helping healthcare providers take care of their patients better. We saw the patients themselves taking ownership to stay healthy and be monitored at home. Governance stepped in to help the healthcare environment in their countries. And finally, we saw new business models and new reimbursements. So how can we keep this energy, this creativity, and this collaboration that we saw during COVID also after COVID? And I think we can sustain this only by collaborating. Nobody can change and and, and help the transformation of healthcare on its own. We have to do this together to concentrate on patient-centered care, on value-based care, on, on better outcome for our patients. And I would like to conclude with, with, with my messages that I would give to the panel to discuss further on. I think together, collaborating in innovation and research, we have to help the healthcare environment move into the value-based care, uh, in a value-based care delivery system. Second, we have to build co coherent data and platform strategies. And in Europe, we have to invest heavily to make this, to make Europe the best place for impactful research and position Europe as a leading global player. I would leave it at that, Maxim. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And of course, we'll hear more from you later during the discussion, as we will from all of our panelists today. Don't forget, get your questions in for the panelists. Uh, Mark Miller. Thank you. Good day. Um, my name is Mark Miller, and I'm the Executive VP uh, Chief Medical Officer at Biomaria. Biomaria is a, a pure diagnostics IVD company. We specialize in infectious diseases and acute care. Uh, we're proud that we were the first IVD company to be a research partner in FPIA, and also we're the first co-lead of an IMI project called Value DX, which was the first primarily diagnostics project that you heard about from Pierre. Um, we believe that the development of innovative diagnostics is vital for important unmet medical needs. Um, it's been estimated that about 70 to 80% of medical decision-making is based on diagnostic results, but only about 3% of healthcare spending is in diagnostics. And that means that diagnostics are not truly valued sufficiently. Uh, but one only has to look at the current COVID-19 pandemic to understand the true value of diagnostics. Where would we be today without diagnostics for COVID? Um, in the past, unfortunately, diagnostics have not been included in many of the PPPs where they could have benefited the projects, uh, but we still believe in PPPs and we still see the immense value of PPPs uh, as, as a diagnostics company. Why, why do we believe in PPPs? And essentially, the, the it may seem redundant and it's already been mentioned, but the three major reasons that we firmly believe that PPPs is the way of the future is uh, number one, risk, number two, cost, and number three, synergistic competencies. The costs and the risks associated with developing innovative and vital diagnostics has increased considerably, and it is very difficult for a single player to shoulder all of this. This includes all the risks associated with all phases, including R&D, regulatory hurdles that you heard about, the necessary market access components, and PPPs are a way of sharing these risks and costs, which would be and are prohibitive for a single entity. In terms of synergistic competencies, um, there's an increased requirement for advanced competence in engineering, chemistry, software development, cybersecurity, and other key activities to develop really useful innovative diagnostics. But more importantly, by combining complementary knowledge and experience, diagnostics with therapeutics, diagnostics with vaccines, diagnostics with certain medical devices and interventions, through these collaborations with these academic diagnostic, therapeutic and device experts, we can synergistically achieve a real improved personalized medicine, which we cannot do alone. The combination of innovative diagnostics 
cutting edge interventions is the future of medical care for personalized medicine. So in conclusion, we believe that a diagnostic approach and diagnostics themselves should be considered or included in many of the healthcare PPPs that are uh, being offered and, and uh, are being talked about. We also believe that PPPs, when they're well-constructed and well-financed, can decrease costs, they can mitigate risks significantly, and more importantly, they can build on synergistic competencies of the various partners increasing the chances of success and improving patient outcomes. Thank you very much. Mark, thank you very much indeed for that. And Irene Nordstedt. Yes, good morning, everybody. So uh, first, my apologies for my director general, Jean-Éric Paquet, who was supposed to be here. He has some technical problems. He's still trying to connect and I hope he will be able to join. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, I'm really pleased to be here and uh, having followed IMI from its uh, first ideas and conception years ago is quite amazing to see how far we have come. And uh, as we're now uh, approaching the end of IMI 2 program, it's a really good time to take stock. Uh, of uh, what has been achieved and uh, to be build a bridge uh, towards this new uh, future partnership. So when we started IMI, uh, a long time ago, it feels like right now, um, it was really the first time the pharmaceutical industry uh, really worked together. Um, and uh, IMI has really had a key role in fostering uh, competitors to come together and to uh, work together, uh, not only between each other, but also, of course, with academia, SMEs, while also strongly increasing the interactions with patients and healthcare professionals. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate IMI for uh, many of its successes. And you heard Pierre Mulien mentioning several areas where IMI has provided leaps in terms of the science, for example, in Alzheimer's, autism, diabetes, and many other areas. Uh, but I'm particularly proud indeed of the Ebola Plus program, uh, which started uh, exactly at the time when we started IMI2. Uh, and this program has resulted in the Ebola vaccine uh, that also was authorized in July here. And uh, this demonstrates clearly yet again the power of collaboration and how the European RNI leadership really can tackle uh, serious health threats. And uh, I'm also hopeful that the IMI projects on coronavirus soon will also help uh, to bring forward uh, testing and treatments for COVID-19. The experience from IMI is that we can and we should enable active engagement also with other health industry sectors uh, beyond the pharma. And uh, this is going to happen soon, and it is already happening. We have seen this uh, in some of the IMI projects already. Um, and uh, we are, of course, hoping now to be able to present uh, the new public-private partnership uh, in health uh, already next year. Uh, this new partnership uh, that we temporarily has baptized the Innovative Health Initiative uh, will indeed bring together uh, the EU and uh, several health-related industry sectors, so pharmaceuticals, biotech, diagnostic, medical devices, imaging and digital. Um, this partnership uh, will facilitate the integration of the various health technologies, including uh, the digital, as I mentioned, in meaningful health innovations. Um, and I think this is really important because uh, over the years, we are also starting to see a convergence and more uh, combined type of uh, products and technologies. So this is really an uh, important uh, path to go forward. This integration is the floor it will in healthcare uh, and also of the competitiveness of the EU health sector. And I really trust that the Innovative Health Initiative will live, live up to this challenge. Um, and uh, I am particularly pleased part of this forum is devoted to pediatric cancer. Cancer. Uh, as I'm sure that you all are aware of, uh, Horizon Europe has introduced the novelty of missions. 
And uh, here there are five mission areas and one of them is cancer. But thank you for opening that up while we could hear you. Thank you. Um, let's get straight into the panel discussion now. And, and do thank get you. your questions in for us, please. Um, I just want to ask the panel in general and whoever would like to answer it, please raise your hand. Think about the timing for this new partnership. Is this the right timing, do you think? Who would like to take that? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I did. I told that already in my introduction. It is exactly the right timing. First of all, for two reasons. Uh, one that we could um, uh, forecast at the beginning and one that we have experienced recently is the COVID. The one that we experienced recently is COVID. Now we have to do it. If we don't find a way to collaborate in, to, it, to the optimal effect today, we will never be able to do it. So the time is really ripe. And the one that we could forecast has to do with digitalization. We know what platforms can do. We know what data can do. We know that the EU is working on, uh, on data, on data platforms, on sharing of patient data. So it's, and we can work together, pharma as well as, well as medtech, because we have now these opportunities. So it's very, very timely. And I'd like to bring Mark in on that, because you talked about the importance of diagnostics. Explain a little bit more, particularly with the timing. Yeah, so I mean, I think that the timing is um, absolutely crucial now. I think that looking back over the past, say, decade, it's become very obvious that a lot of the successes that we've had in healthcare have been done through collaborative projects, that individual companies, uh, certainly in the field of infectious diseases, have been less successful at bringing uh, good therapeutics uh, and vaccines to the marketplace to benefit patients alone and much more successful when they've been done in partnerships. So if we look back at the history of what, what brings success and what doesn't, um, collaborations and, uh, or, and, and, and associations or collaborations like PPPs um, are successful. As medicine gets more complex, it's certainly obvious that we have to start combining our forces. And not just you know therapeutic company with another therapeutic company, but also diagnostics with therapeutics, diagnostics with vaccines, et cetera. So I think that there are, and there are certain models where we just haven't had success. Tuberculosis is an example um, where we just haven't had a lot of success, and where we have to start bringing different synergistic competencies together. So I think I, I totally agree. This is the time for everybody, and we've already started thinking about how to work better together because we see that it works. Okay, would anyone else on the panel like to comment on that? Yes, Maxine, I just can say that the timing of this new partnership makes a lot of sense. We are currently facing an uh, unprecedented health challenges that reflect the needs for stakeholders with different expertise to work together in a collaborative manner to translate science into health solutions for patients, citizens, and health system. And such partnership ultimately accelerates patient access to health solution and boosts the competitiveness of Europe as identified in the upcoming European pharmaceutical strategy. So it's very important and time is uh, the better. And Irene, I saw you raise your hand there. You have a comment. So Irene here, if I can, if I, yeah, so if I can come in as well. Um, I, I also just wanted to comment on the timing. I think it's a perfect timing uh, because we have seen through the evolution of MIE2 uh, that more and more uh, technologies are coming together. And this is definitely a need to come together in areas such as the brain. We already mentioned cancer, which will be the theme of this particular meeting, uh, where it's really important to bring all together uh, the imaging, the diagnostics, the digital, the biotech, the pharma, and also the vaccine uh, uh, sector is so really important and also uh, in view of uh, the new pharma strategy that has been mentioned and also the European health data space which is a particular priority uh, for uh, the EU in the coming years so uh, we hope that this new partnership will be a strong contributor uh, to all these difference and of course the beating cancer the European beating cancer plan where I, uh, the future partnership also can be a very strong contributor to to implement this one. Just to throw forward a little bit our test case for the second panel is of course using pediatric cancer so we'll be re returning to that with a few questions coming in actually panel um, an interesting one um, 
Will businesses share their data in the platforms? Who would like to take that? Mark. Well, I mean, I think, you know, depending on what you mean by sharing and data, I mean, everything to be defined, but I mean, that's a given. If, if we don't share data, then it's not truly a collaboration. Um, I think it brings up another aspect in that previous PPPs, it's not been recognized the true value of the data that a partner brings in to the, to the association, to the collaboration. There's pre-existing data, there's data generated within the project. And I think that the value of some of this data and these databases that are brought in are extremely valuable uh, and contribute enormously to the collaboration, to the consortium. So that has to be valorized right from the beginning. But of course, sharing is absolutely important for us to move ahead. There has to be a level of trust. There has to be an environment of total sharing. Um, and, uh, and this trust issue is very important uh, because that's why we're there. We're there to do it together. If people keep things back and, and don't share completely, uh, it won't be a success. Uh, does the panel agree with that? Or is there anyone who would disagree? I think we're all in agreement on yeah, that. I would, I would strongly support it, uh, what, what Mark is saying. And I think Europe has a, a very important task here as, a, uh, as, as the, the governing, da governing data, making it possible to share data in a secure and safe way taking away unnecessary roadblocks to, to share data, and then we will all be prepared to do it and to share it with each other for the better, uh, better health of our patients. Yeah, and just while I've got you here, we've yeah. had a question from Chris uh, saying you, you really liking your opening statement, but also saying um, he's afraid or she's afraid that without reform of the healthcare systems, it won't work to its full extent. Um, publicly funded healthcare, of course, having to its own saving policies as well. Uh, just a quick comment on that, maybe. Yeah, you know, it's you can be waiting for somebody else to change. You can say, okay, we cannot do that until the healthcare system has changed as a whole. I, I really don't believe in that. We have to make this change happen all together, and everybody has its own role to play. It's the time is up to to. To, to continue waiting for each other, we have to, to lock arms and start doing it together. And this IMI initiative where we bring together medtech and uh, uh, big pharma and small pharma and startups is going to, to incentivize this and facilitate this. And just, I'm, I'm going to hold on to you there because interestingly, a follow-up question talking about Meditech diagnostics and pharma collaborating. And the question is, should they collaborate under the umbrella? rather than one mainly focused on pharma and the other one mainly on diagnostics? No, I think they should collaborate under one umbrella and we're doing that, we're doing that already on an incidental, ba an incidental uh, uh, basis on occasion. So there is, there is already collaboration between individual pharma and medtech companies, uh, sharing platforms, sharing data. We could bring that to the next level, to the higher level on the IMI, bringing more partners on board on the same projects, on joint projects. Mm. OK, um, I just want to ask a, myself a general question to the panel. What would be the best mechanism, do you think, to strengthen the openness and inclusiveness of the new partnership, the next partnership? Olivier. Yes, yes, I think that the best mechanism to achieve these goals resides in a framework flexible enough to ensure significant participation from industry. As an example, usual uh, practices in place in each and every company should be used to reduce the uh, administrative burden and make this partnership attractive for private contributors. In addition, attracting best input and data with contribution from outside Europe is part of Europe's strategic resilience, or I would say survival goal. And Mark, I think you were interested in coming in this one as well. And Irene, I'll come to you in one second. 
Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think that flexibility is a key attribute, and that flexibility includes non-EU countries, non-EU partners. There are some valuable people um, out there in the world that can help and contribute to important projects, but because of administrative glitches or rules, uh, they're not eligible or can't be included or funding can't be diverted, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, now with Brexit, it's getting more complex uh, to include anybody from the UK. Uh, and these, these, this type of flexibility has to continue and we have to be even more flexible. Um, we have to have collaborators from Latin America, from Africa, from parts of Asia. And some of these are, are, are really quite creative and very good and have the expertise that we need. So I think I totally agree with Olivier. We have to be flexible. It has to be geographically flexible. We also have to be flexible in terms of what's eligible to be included in these partnerships. Uh, and the more flexible and creative we are, uh, I think the more successful we'll be. And, and interestingly, a question has come in saying a clear weakness of IMI is there, are those hurdles to bringing in non-EU partners. Irene, can I come to you on that? Uh, well, I would say that uh, I don't see what the hurdles are. There, there are a lot of international cooperation actually going on through IMI, uh, but we should also be clear that the uh, sort of one of the main objectives of IMI has really been to strengthen the European science base and, and increase the competitiveness in Europe. Uh, but I would also like to come back on the previous uh, question there in terms of... Uh, for because I think this has been one of the true strengths of uh, um, of IMI, and that has been that it can act as a fantastic platform uh, for different sectors and for different entities, uh, being the uh, public or private patients associations and also uh, other type of entities such as HTA bodies, uh, SMEs, uh, any type of, of company. And I think this has been one of the strengths of IMI that it can really act as a facilitator and what we would say kind of a neutral broker in bring all these different uh, sectors together to have sort of very good discussions about what are the needs and uh, you know, then to go forward and bring together a cooperation uh, between all these different entities. So I think this has been one of the, the strong strengths of, of uh, this public-private partnership. Over. Uh, Irene, thank you very much. Would anyone on the panel like to come back on Irene's comments there? Um, in fact, I, I can now announce that uh, luckily we've overcome some issues and Jean-Éric Paquet, who is the G Director General for Research and Innovation at the European Commission, has now joined us. Very uh, big warm welcome to you, Jean-Éric. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. We would like to hear from you. The other speakers had their three minutes at the top of the discussion, so we would very much like to hear your thoughts as well, if you'd like to give them to us. <coughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, and again, apologies for, for crashing in in the middle of the panel. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, I think uh, Irene certainly covered the ground from the point of view of the Commission. So let me maybe add um, a few uh, personal considerations. Um, the first one is I think that uh, IMI has been one of our flagship partnerships, uh, which has uh, demonstrated um, that uh, public resources and private resources can make um, uh, a, a real difference um, in bringing indeed um, uh, actors which usually don't work together uh, on a common platform. And I have been um, uh, quite impressed um, over the last uh, partnership, uh, particularly at the outset, with the mobilization of Ebola, uh, where um, we were not only uh, impacting the vaccine, as we now have seen, in, but my really agile organization helping us to make an impact on the ground very quickly. So the, the track record is, is really very good. And uh, from that point of view, um, I'm really uh, very pleased that the partnership is uh, moving into the future, broadening, of course. I think that is going to be a, a real uh, asset uh, to tackle the complexity of health-related problems uh, on, a, on a broader scale. And the work which is right now ongoing um, on COVID-19, uh, where also um, uh, 
IMI is making uh, an important contribution. Uh, we, we might uh, hear uh, during the day um, uh, the, the, the present state of play of the very many projects which were identified um, a few months ago. Uh, but I think the COVID-19 pandemic uh, shows that you need to tackle health-related um, issues on a much broader scale. And uh, the preparations for the, the next generation of partnership is, from that point of view, uh, very promising. There needs to be, and that's my, my last point, uh, industry and industry resources. Uh, Horizon Europe is going to be a very uh, significant program. Uh, of course, we were, like many other, pro many other programs, uh, constrained from a, a budget point of view. And I think this makes um, the, the, the need for all actors uh, in partnerships generally, but also in the next um, uh, IMI uh, incarnation, this really requires uh, resources on both sides um, so that we can have the, the scope and impact which we need to have. But I'm very much looking forward to see uh, the last mile uh, of um, the preparations of the partnership will be there, uh, I think, in good time with um, Horizon Europe. We are now closing... Uh, the negotiations, um, as you probably all have seen, uh, there's expectation that on the overall EU budget, the MFF, uh, uh, there could be uh, a breakthrough um, uh, in the next hours. And that will then, uh, I expect, allow the European Parliament and the Council with Maria Gabriel on the horizon already as planned at the beginning of the year. And therefore, the, the good work um, in preparing the partnership, I think, will... Uh, uh, allowed to move uh, very um, quickly by the end of the year, beginning of next year, to uh, have the partnership in place in the course of 21. So uh, uh, it's a good moment to to take stock uh, and prepare um, that more ambitious new partnership. Thanks. Uh, Jean-Éric, thank you very much indeed. And just while um, you're talking about those partnerships, what would you feel are the expected impacts of the new partnership? And I, I'm thinking in terms of both EU health context and also the competitiveness of the industries that will be involved? Well, we'll, we'll I mean, we, are, we are still working on trying to define the, the impacts in the partnership itself. I think we need indeed to be able to track those um, uh, and, and, and demonstrate that the, the significant resource, I mean, uh, companies will need to demonstrate it on their side. We will need to, uh, to demonstrate it um, uh, on the side of uh, of public funding, but I I, I do expect uh, uh, that the impact will uh, will allow us to to deal with um, with health um, issues on a on a as I said earlier on a much broader basis um, and indeed uh, connect um, uh, health related issues not just um, uh, through the, the pharma lens uh, but also combine it. Um, uh, with medtech, biotech, uh, and of course the very important digital dimension of health. Uh, in this pandemic, we are all learning um, that you need to look at health issues uh, in this broader basis if you want to have an impact. Uh, and most of um, of the uh, health issues uh, which our societies are confronting uh, are, uh, are are indeed extremely complex. Um, uh, linked to um, our, our environment, uh, linked to food uh, and scientific illnesses, and uh, you, you, you need the systemic approach. What you also uh, would want to see happening uh, on a much uh, broader basis, and I think having uh, this broader partnership in, uh, in, in the next uh, partnership will certainly also help, is a better connection with um, uh, society, with citizens, I mean, patient organizations are well connected to the present partnership already, but I think we can certainly also uh, do a bit more there. Uh, and I think we, we, we need to devise um, uh, health strategies, um, taking into account uh, patients, but also the views of citizens. And I think that will be very important for the partnership as well. So all these are, are developments which I think are, are made possible uh, with the, the broader partnership and with also the broader approach we are taking generally on our partnerships. Thank you very much. Would anyone else on the panel like to come in on that particular one? What it, the impact of the new partnership would look like, in, both in the health context and also in the competitiveness of the industries involved? 
Anyone like to take that? Mark, are you gearing up to talk to us there? Uh, what was the question in terms of synergies with other uh, entities? Yeah, it's what, the, what would the new partnership look like, do you think? Um, and we're looking at the context of EU health in general and also the competitiveness of the industries who would be involved in that partnership. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the IMI scheme, as, as Pierre Moulin said, is, is very innovative, um, truly, in terms of associating academics and startups with established large industrial companies, whether they're diagnostic or therapeutic. Um, I think it was, it was quite innovative and worked very well. Uh, we were not used to dealing with those kinds of large consortia. Uh, there was all kinds of issues on consortia contracts and, and working together. But I think that uh, after a few years, we've, we've ironed out all the difficulties. And I, I think that type of creativity where you put um, academics who are, are very strong in, in, um, in, in upstream um, science uh, and you put them with startup companies who are reactive and flexible and, and enthusiastic, uh, you know, with large industrial companies who tend to be slower and more methodical, but have great skills in terms of market access, uh, regulatory issues, uh, you know, production, et cetera. I think it's very complementary, And I, I see more of that in the, um, in the kinds of consortia that make sense. Uh, I think that the focus has to be on complementarity. Um, and I think that's what's worked in the past. So the type of model that I think we're looking forward to is, is models of uh, participation and collaboration where everybody brings something different to the table, uh, because that really can work on the synergistic aspects of this. Thank you. And just to follow up on that question with the entire panel, what do you think would be the best mechanisms to strengthen that openness and inclusiveness of the next partnership that we've just been hearing about? Uh, yes. If, if I can, yeah. if I can open it up, um, I I think when you are looking at the ultimate goal, uh, and you can share a common purpose uh, for us, and and to scope it maybe a little bit better, a certain the purpose could be to improve the outcome of a certain category of patients that could be helped by both medtech. Uh, propositions and solutions as well as um, uh, uh, pharma uh, propositions and solutions, bringing these two together, then you will find a way to go around this competition. But you have to keep your purpose straight in front of you, always in front of your eyes that you want to improve the lives of these people. And then you will get around the, the and there will be a win for, for all of us, not only for the patients, but also for the, both the companies. Thank or for you. all the partners in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the corporation. Thank you. Does anyone else want to comment on this before we go into some more questions from the audience? Uh, it's uh, only by sharing that our knowledge and now that and, and know how that together we will build uh, this resilient ecosystem to boost the competitiveness uh, of our industry in, in Europe. That's very important. Sharing that our knowledge and know how. Thank you very much. Mark, a brief comment? Are you okay? Oh, yeah. I just, uh, if, 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 if I could add anything to, to make this, uh, to improve it, I think we need to bring in people that are not traditionally included into these projects, such as regulatory agencies, health technology assessment uh, um, entities in the, in the countries uh, that would really assist us, uh, you know, once the project is near completion mm -hmm. or even during the project to, to facilitate the market access of, of, of whatever we come out with these projects. We really need a lot of regulatory support uh, HTA support, health economic support. That's not been a, a great force in, in the previous projects that I think we need to stress. Thank you. Interesting thoughts. Irene, would you have a comment on that one? Bring in a, a different types of actors into the group. Mm -hmm. So uh, so thank you. So indeed, I agree that it's very important to bring in in different actors, regulatory. Uh, I think we need to be very careful because they have a very specific role. Uh, so uh, we already see in IMI2 that we have regulators participating in certain projects, but not in other project, projects. So this is something that uh, you... 
to uh, ban. So this is already happening, to be honest, and it's the same for, for HGA bodies as well, who are also participating, but on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's very, very much, uh, you know, what is the scope? So one thing uh, is, of course, to participate in the actual project and the research to be done. But another aspect is also to listen in what are the needs of the regulators, what are the needs um, for of entities in terms uh, of uh, research and innovation. Uh, so this is another type of discussion which uh, can be held uh, in a very, very broad base. And I would like to come back on the importance uh, of uh, really bringing in uh, the voice of the patients and, and of citizens at large. Uh, I think that is really, really important. I think this is something that we should work a lot more on. Uh, great uh, steps has been taken throughout IMI and IMI2, uh, but I think that we should uh, do even more in the future there to really look at you know, what would the citizens like to see and what are the particular requirements that, uh, or, or what would patients really would like to, to have there. Over. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, a lot of questions coming in for the panel uh, over a variety of issues. If you're having difficulty, I know some of you are here on the, on the panelists. I will repeat the questions for you if you need that. Um, we're talking about uh, a lot of questions coming in on competitiveness and funding. How is EU industrial competitiveness? How will it be reinforced? when the initiative is open without restriction worldwide? Will EU funding only match EU in kind or commitments to achieve this? So, and there's a couple of others. Let me just give you a flavor of the funding questions that are coming in. Will IMI consider funding startup SMEs at 100% or develop mechanisms to bridge the funding gap left after winning a grant? And also another question on funding is funding more than one project per topic under consideration for IHI, because this would dramatically increase participation, excellence, results delivery, and deployment of solutions. So quite a number of thoughts there around funding. So uh, for timing, we're of course in the uh, starting blocks of this new partnership, uh, but in general, I mean, we would apply the, uh, the, the same rules that we do have in uh, Horizon Europe. Um, so uh, when it comes to the different types of, uh, of calls that, that we visit to IMI2, because we have a new set of, uh, of partners to work with, so we are currently looking at, uh, you know, how this will, uh, will be done in practice. So uh, this is uh, an open, open question for time being. Uh, but in general, we would, of course, use the same uh, funding principles that we do use in Horizon Europe. And I would also like to draw the attention that IMI is not, uh, or e the future partnership is not the only instrument. We also have the European Innovation Council, which, of course, is uh, specifically dedicated to small companies. Uh, we will also have the uh, a more traditional collaborative research uh, program. And uh, we need to look at all those in uh, sort of in in synergy, like an orchestra, where we can look at different tools and what you should achieve with different tools. As Pierre was also mentioning in his introduction, uh, a public-private partnership you should use where you really need a public-private partnership to achieve certain objectives. There may be other tools, maybe better dedicated to solve other challenges or issues. So uh, I think that it's not something that fits all the challenges, but for certain challenges, uh, and there we should really use this tool. Over. Irene, thank you very much indeed. I don't know if we've got Jean-Éric back again. Can you, because um, I, I was really interested in hearing your thoughts on those funding questions. Well, um, I think Irene uh, made made the, the 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 right point. We will need to look across the entire program. Uh, not all will will be possible or will be needed in um, in the innovative um, uh, health initiative or whatever the name uh, ends up uh, being. There are many other parts of the program which, and we've seen it. Um, uh, with COVID-19, which can have uh, quite a big impact um, on innovation, which was one of the questions, indeed, particularly the European Innovation Council, uh, which is um, proving already today we are in a pilot phase for the European 15 and 20, with about a billion and a half, so a pilot phase really at scale. 
uh, that we are um, able uh, to find um, very quickly uh, those um, uh, ecosystem actors which are not yet the industry, so startups, um, SMEs, which work um, uh, in deep tech and how the areas where the EIC has attracted really very many proposals with quite a lot of funding um, which went into these um, um, house-related or, or, or medtech, biotech um, uh, companies. So the EIC will play a really very important role in the overall landscape. And I think one of the um, challenges practically is going to be for all partnerships, uh, this one included, indeed to be better connected to the rest of the research carried out. This is one of the uh, one of the limitations of delivery of Horizon 2020 and of partnerships today. So we need to do better in the future. We want particularly that institutional partnerships such as this one are properly connected with one. Uh, in the case, um, uh, th there will be links and synergies um, uh, to be identified um, notably with the digital partnerships which are being put in place. Uh, digital, the digital dimension of house will of course be covered in part with the partnership uh, and, and the membership in the partnership on the industry side here. But you will certainly also want to work with the microelectronics uh, partnership which is being um, set up. That's one uh, link and illustration, um, I think, which is going to be quite important. And I'm sure that um, we will identify a number of uh, additional areas where these links uh, exist. If I then take, uh, as, as Irene mentioned, the, the cancer mission, uh, here again we hope on cancer particularly, where I have no doubt that there will be also a lot of interest um, uh, from uh, industry partners in, in the partnership uh, to, 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 to be mobilized. I very much hope that um, the work on the cancer mission, which will of course also be uh, funded in part in Horizon um, Europe, in the health part of Horizon Europe, as is the partnership, that we can here also establish very close to connect. And that's the way, I think, which, where we will magnify our impact. With one additional dimension, which is not often discussed <clears throat> uh, with IMI today, which I hope will become more relevant in the future as we move forward, is to have a, a greater effort done at the broader European landscape. Because the reality is that uh, a lot of your own activities and your own research um, uh, funding, aside of the one which you are funding yourselves, is done on a national basis. So there's a lot of uh, uh, funding coming from national sources, and, and, and the reality of European research is that 90% is, uh, is done at national level. And so in the European research area, broader context, um, we need to deploy uh, Horizon Europe so that it also uh, leverages um, alignment um, and uh, impact on, on the national systems. And conversely, that national uh, funding can also help um, by being connected and, and maybe in some cases even um, uh, very closely integrated, that it can make a difference also on the outcome in health-related research around the partnership. So there are many avenues um, uh, which we will promote generally and which we hope we can also see the new partnership uh, delve into. Jean Eric, thank you very much indeed. We've, we've got so many questions coming in, and really we're out of time. But the questions are covering all sorts of things funding, what about the uptake uh, of the products developed, um, talking about data, linking with other European infrastructures. It's a conversation that can go on for a long time. And I think if we were networking in person, it probably would be around the tea trolley um, and the coffee trolley in a few minutes. I just want to give everyone on the panel. Um, a very last final thought, no more than a minute, please, because we are running out of time. But if we could just have your final thoughts, perhaps on where you see we're going, um, perhaps challenges to overcome, whatever you think. Irene, can I start with you, please? Just very briefly. Mm -hmm. So thank you, very, thank you very much. So um, I, I think that um, the future partnership will be very interesting. We are a little bit breaking with the paw, take the best, if I may say. Um, and I think that uh, I want to come back on the cancer mission, because I think that with these 
uh, of uh, industries on board, I think we can really contribute uh, towards the cancer mission with this partnership. I would also like to take the area of brain. You already heard about the Alzheimer mentioned before. And I think, again, with this different set of companies, I think that this is another area where really this future partnership really can make leaps forward uh, by coming together working together, as I mentioned, with, with all the different actors uh, in the health, very well identified common goals. That is really what I would like to see this partnership to go. Irene, thank you very much indeed for your Over. comments. Mark, could I come to you? Sure. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is reiterate just our belief in PPPs, that this is something that we believe is is really important and, uh, and the way of the future in terms of participation and collaboration. The second thing is I, I really like that question that somebody asked at the end. You didn't get around to it, unfortunately, but I think that's a, that's the message that I want to leave with is, OK, so what happens when the project finishes and we have something? How does it get into the market and how does it get to patients? And I think that's really important. And we have to start considering, including, as I said, the non-traditional people in these research projects that help with the market access, that help with the regulatory submissions, with the reimbursement, with the health technology assessments with the post-market studies and real-world evidence to show the validation of whatever we develop, whether it's a vaccine, a diagnostic, whether it's personalized medicine, whether it's data. Um, we have to really show the value uh, and we have to get to that value economic model, that health economic model to show the true value of what we do, what we deliver. Okay. So I think okay. that we have to kind of, you know, yep. Thanks, Mark. Sorry, we are running out of time and I do want to hear comments from everybody else, but very pertinent there. Jan. Yeah, this new health PPP will give us the opportunity to collaborate more strongly, supported by a solid data and platform framework, as well as a realistic regulatory stewardship. And this eventually will improve the lives of patients who are really counting on us to work together. And we are very committed to make this a success. Jan, thank you very much. Olivier. Yes, our ambitious vision for the future of health innovation includes creating a research development innovation ecosystem with the right level of resources, including the huge in-kind contribution from the uh, industry and making an impact for patient society and the economy European and including cross-sectorial contribution from all the world the world. Olivia, thank you very much for your contribution. And Jean-Éric, if we could have one short final thought from you as well, please. Well, the expectation, I think, is that the, the partnership will be an um, industry's contribution to what Europeans expect, which is a, a European level a health policy compl complementing what is happening at national level. I think the broader um, the, the broad membership, which is uh, going to be put in place, would allow that, including with the impact uh, which uh, we will have on, um, on the House of Europeans. So very much looking forward to see it in place. Johnny, Eric, thank you very much indeed. I want to thank all of our panellists. Um, we've had a few technical difficulties. I hope you were able to all understand what everyone was saying. An absolutely fascinating discussion and so many questions. We could be here all day answering them, but it just shows that the quality and number of the questions, how much interest there is in what is going on in particular in the future.